everyone and welcome to this lecture. Um, as you can see, you, you know, you've not, you're not, your eyes do not deceive you. I'm not wearing a funny green screen shirt. I've just decided to uh, dress as the uh, LSA bookshelf today. Um, to my left, I've got Peter Buchanan, um, who's reader in um, urbanism and history at the London School of Architecture and Theory, sorry. He will be um, posing some questions to Indy after the lecture today. Um, but before I start, I just want to say a um, quick thank you to the Stowe Foundation, who've been promoting educational projects for architecture students around the world for 15 years. Um, the November Talks, which this is uh, a part of, um, are normally face-to-face -face events in university lecture halls, and they're also part of this. However, obviously today we're on Zoom, um, but which is why we're able to get so many people and people from across the world for this whole series. Um, but for this, I'd like to thank Stowe on behalf of the students and uh, the faculty at the LSA. And without further ado, I will introduce uh, Indy Johar, who's going to be talking about um, his practice architecture zero zero. So Indy, take the floor. Firstly, delighted and honored to be here. And uh, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm, I suppose I'm, it's a really interesting moment to be talking about architecture. And I'm in many ways honored. Um, I want to use this conversation to open up a frame and I think it's a really important moment for us to reflect on the role of architecture and the contribution of architecture and I see my contribution today to perhaps set a frame for a wider conversation that I think you're going to be having over November and I want to take a moment for us to go into some of the deep radical structural changes that we're seeing at a societal level and ask some hard questions about the role and contribution of architecture over the next 10, 15, 20 years. So I hope this contribution is seen as part of a part of the whole November series. Um, and I hope I want to contribute where I think my journey has been going over the last 15 years of how we change and evolve architecture and the built environment and what the implications are. So I just want to situate that this conversation into that reality. Uh, part of, I suppose, what I, um, you'll see this lecture isn't uh, an autobiographic lecture. I want to actually talk about some of the radical transitions that we're facing. But a little bit of context, um, uh, I suppose I'm right now, I'm on behalf of Zero Zero leading Dark Matter Labs, uh, we're now a 40 person organization, uh, which have team members in Seoul, all the way through to Montreal and uh, in um, and in uh, Berlin and in London and Glasgow, we're a decentralized team and working full time, uh, all the way from having data scientists to uh, service designers to researchers in different roles. Um, a little bit of zero zero, and I'm only doing this to give you context. I mean, uh, I was uh, along with David Saxby, co founded um, zero zero. <coughs> zero zero has obviously architecture zero zero, we built that. We also were part of building open desk open source furniture company wiki house open source housing uh, several impact hubs including impact hub co-founding of impact Hub birmingham but also um uh, westminster and various others um and studio weave is also part of the family and dark matter labs is one of those components so just to situate that my history has really come from um, recognizing that in a way to transition our built environment sometimes yes we produce architecture in the classical form but we also have to be able to construct and make in really radical forms and we've been working across that space and you know uh, the wiki house open desk stuff is all well known the last four years in this conversation has meant one of the things i became very interested in was actually the underlying issues behind our architecture uh, whether you look at urban regeneration and why it basically drives the rent seeking model, why it drives gentrification, or whether you look at even open source furniture and what the challenge of selling open source furniture is around mortgages and or sort of mortgages for open source housing. How do you do that in decentralized quality mechanisms? And so what, what I started to look at was actually, we often talk, you know, talk about form follows function, form follows finance is the other one that everyone often talks about but also form follows contract. What is the contractual legal relationships which structure our built environment in a way, the way the coding, the deep coding of capital and how it structures our built environment. And it's in this thesis, I wanna talk about the way forward. Um, 
the moment that we're sitting in and the moment we're in is fundamentally, I think, a challenging moment. It's the moment that I think when we look at COVID and what we see around us, you know, we've seen millions of, you know, over a million people dead around the world, maybe close to nine to 10 million just in, uh, in the US alone. At the same time, you know, what, we've seen a 15% GDP bounce back in the UK, but we were nearly 30% down in GDP. And by the end of the, this lockdown, who knows where we are? Certainly the Britain, Britain was facing one of the worst recessions in 300 years. At the same time, social inequalities have been growing. Uh, globally, absolute poverty has been growing as well. And in a way, it's into this context that we look into the future of our cities. And I suppose one of the challenges I want to place out in the room is I think our vision of the future city and our vision of how cities are is still locked into a kind of late, uh, late 1999 party of kind of um, the cafe culture with a balloon and urban density and a conversation which is really locked into the urban renaissance thesis. And I wonder whether that, that thesis holds steady in the next 10 years, when I think we'll face some of the biggest structural issues that we probably face as a civilization. And in a way, when you look at it through that lens, what we look at and we see COVID has revealed certain things. It's revealed the fragility of our system. You know, places like Sweden, where we're working with um, the sort of Venova and various other partners, it's very clear that, for example, it's revealed um, the vulnerability of our food systems. You've got places like Sweden starting to talk about how to redesign our food systems because they're foundational assets for our society. You know, places across the world are already looking to export ban certain food groups next year, next year because they recognise there will be shortages as a result of the COVID issue, issue. At the same time, what we're seeing is, you know, reconfiguration systemically of our relationship between state, markets, households, and civil society. You know, I was, again, I was talking to an assistant chief minister in Pakistan who turned around and said, you know, we've had three bailouts in the last 10 years. Bailout is a new public service. So the relationship of market to state is fundamentally being reconfigured. Another a very erudite person said, we're all China now, as we're all actually in relationship with the state. The idea of independence is kind of questionable. And at the same time, systemic injustices, which were buried, visible, are now actually being revealed. Uh, and accelerated. So we know actually, you know, whether it's Black Lives Matter, the kind of the the, uh, the issues are being made visible. Also, actually, disproportionate impacts into those systemic injustices are, is is happening. And global interdependence, well, albeit we we're constantly discussing Brexit, actually, global interdependence is also becoming more and more real. COVID is not a single country issue. You see unprecedented, unprecedented global global coordination of scientific endeavour. Um, in a way that's never been done before at rapid scales. So we're starting to see a new form of global interdependence becoming manifest. But at the same time, I think it's worth recognizing COVID is a herald, a beginning of a long age of emergencies. You know, if you look at the COVID risk, then you look at the economic fallout, then you look at the climate change impacts, then you look at the biodiversity losses that we're about to say. So I think we're at the beginning of a new age of some of these systemic risks that we've been facing starting to manifest. And that's driving into a cascade of risks. So, and then, you know, when we talk about the cascade of risks of how people are living, it's very clear the London house is next to useless in this new, new COVID economy. Um, actually, love, you know, if, you, if you're having to live more than 40 minutes in your house with four people, with three rooms, it actually just struggles to work. UK house, the London house has housing has some of the lowest amounts of square meters um, anywhere across Europe. So you start to realize our housing stock, our way of living was fundamentally optimized for a single way of operating. And as soon as that way of living and operating, live, work, and you know, when house becomes a source of working, retail consumption, as well as living, it increasingly becomes um, unviable. And so, and you're seeing that manifest in lots of different ways. You know, domestic violence has massively gone up as a result of actually COVID and the, some of the pressures put on the impact on children's education. Uh, again, massive amounts of inequality emerging as a result of that. So we're starting to see huge cascading effects of both the physical typology that we're living in, how workplaces are changing, and likely to change for a significant amount of time, all the way through to, you know, TFL, 
the mass public transport transportation system no longer become you know increasingly struggling for viability as we start to actually fundamentally change our work economy so the economic geography of our cities is foundationally transforming and even if it transforms to 30 to 40 percent that's a that's a mountain shift of how we're operating and working and that sits in the context of a bigger issue so when we talk about nutrition decline which we're seeing already or entrenching quality which is increasing or environmental violence you know when we know that light pollution air pollution sound pollution have massive cognitive impacts on actually our children but also ourselves you start to question whether our, uh, our cities have been designed to unlock our full self or just to unlock our productive physical capacity. We know already that you know, uh, a child living in high air pollution environment will lose up to a year's worth of education. We know actually the micro stresses of living next to a road, uh, the micro noise of living next to a busy road will, have, uh, will raise your cortisol levels and have substantive impact on a reduction of your lifespan. So when these micro violences are understood, how do we start to think about the built environment? How do we start to redesign our cities, which are which are problematic? We know that um, uh, uh, schizophrenia is twice as likely in urban environments as in rural environments. So there's something about the nature of our environments, which has actually been designed for a physical productive labor unit idea, i.e. us as labor units, but it's certainly not designed for uh, us as to uh, for people to survive, thrive, and grow. So there are some deep questions being raised about the nature of our environment. At the same time, we know that lots of really interesting work going on, the separation of nature, not as a visual act, but actually a deep integrated act is fundamentally problematic. So there's some really brilliant trials going on in Finland about turning schools, uh, putting schools into forests or putting forests into schools because you recognize children being exposed to the microbiomes is fundamental to their autoimmune or their immune uh, capabilities growing and that's a critical part of their intelligence and development growth so at the same time the, the separations that we're talking about are problematic species extinction all the way through to labor market automation so we're seeing a massive um we're seeing a divergence between the return on capital versus the return on labor as more and more of our traditional labor market is is effectively automated and that's not happening you know Uber did not destroy the, the, uh, the Uber driver, it destroyed the cab office. So what we're seeing is the administration and management economy being automated. And that, I think, is a really interesting challenge for middle class economies, which are, I think, being disrupted in a way that we've never talked about. We often think about automation disrupting the physical economy. I don't think it does. It just disrupts the managerial economy. So our cities are having to move from being not post-industrial cities, but post-managerial cities. What is that city? At the same time, democratic disenfranchisement, what does participation look like? How do we build the social contract again, the social accord again, is a fundamental issue. If we're going to move society at the scale of transition that's required, and obviously we're now facing a crunch where actually revenue, whether it's governmental revenue or private revenue, is falling off a cliff. And that opens up some big questions about how this transition manifests in the nature of the debt crisis we're facing. So I situate, I mean, part of the reason I'm going here to start the conversation is that if we want a meaningful debate about the future of architecture and our built environment, we have to meaningfully engage with the structural challenges we're facing as a society. And I think it's critical we recognize that our urban environment, our physical environment, the places we live are probably at the cusp of a significant transformation. What we think was high quality, what our perception of the city which has been constructed is probably about to change. And one of the deep worries I have is that you know, the Cade good, good design thesis has become so indoctrinated across society that it will draw you that ideal vision um, that actually we don't understand deeply the, 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 the risks in the kind of indoctrinated 1999 or, or the 2001 urban renaissance thesis, which has built the cities that we've imagined. You know, is London going to be an in and out of the London story or is it going to become a city of villages reverting back to a different economy of operating, albeit a city of villages linked to a global logistics platform? So we have to start to give ourselves the freedom to challenge the thesis of what we think is the right solution and certainly get re rebuild some of those questions in deeper ways and recognizing that the causes, the challenges that we face, the cause and effects are just delayed and displaced. The crisis has, is, with, is both cascading and there's no single simplistic solution. And, and this 
you know, situate this into this context, right? And I want us all to watch this because I think it's just painfully visible the scale of the transition our cities and places are going to face around the world. We are seeing a massive transformation in our climate, and that's impacting everything. That's impacting our cognitive capabilities, it's impacting our food systems, it's impacting our, our water utility systems, our energy demands, our foundational things are being challenged. And that's not even thinking about the mitigation issues or that, that we're going to have to do to decarbonize. Decarbonizing our economy and society is not just a question of carbon, it's a fundamentally a question of actually a new thesis of governance and our relationship with the world. Climate change is a symptom of a problem, not the problem itself. It's a symptom of our failure of governance in our relationship to the world. And it manifests in lots of different ways. So, you know, 96% of, uh, of mammals on Earth are livestock. Uh, and humans, 4% are wild, so that's by weight. And so you start to see what the scale of the devastation of human impact is. And that's all since the 1970s. So we've seen, you know, we've seen a massive destruction and growth of kind of uh, the livestock and human economy. So there's a really critical question that climate change is just a symptom. There's a much deeper problem going on, a much deeper problem going on in the way of work, where we work. And the other part of this question, which I think is worth recognizing again for us, who people who think about the cities and places, is that we're seeing a massive transition in our, in our economy. Our economy is moving from being focused on tangible goods to intangible goods. Now, the reason why I say this is intangible goods operate, operate fundamentally in a different way. Intangible goods operate in a thesis of, of being high spillover, highly synergistic, um, uh, highly integrated, and they drive a different discourse to tangible goods, which can be sold and discreet. So there's a new type of economy going, which is highly in entangled in its reality. And that entanglement means that for all the, pardon my language, but the, all the bullshit of all the wealth, uh, wealth classes that we have, what's very clear is that this is the UK net, net wealth chart. And what's very clear is that land is the fundamental uh, rent-seeking system in our economy, in this new society. So all the stuff that we talk about, about tech economy and everything else, it's land which has been accruing the value, certainly in uh, many parts of the world. And that's been the centerpiece of driving that. And so the, the governance and arrangement of land, I think, is a really critical conversation in this kind of new intangibles economy. And you know, some of the labor market stuff I've already discussed. So into this thesis, I suppose, what does change look like? And I think I want us as designers and strategic designers to start to think about change, not through the solution of we own a, you know, we know how to build a house. That's the way the solution exists. But how do we drive change? And this has been my personal frustration. Um, uh, this is a diagram of, um, of the housing crisis we face. And it shows, it seeks to show and seeks, seeks to depict effectively the interdependence of multiple issues and how they lock into a Gregorian knot of challenges. And why I show this is that too often we as architects are kind of asked to say, let's solve the housing crisis. And, you know, we as architects get busy sitting there designing, you know, 40,000 pound, 40, pound house, 30,000 pound house, 50,000 pound house. We try to solve the problem. Um, in, in the way that we think we can, which is to build slightly smaller houses um, and get, God, we can do micro homes really efficiently. And actually, in a way, we're solving the wrong problem because what you realize is the micro homes isn't, isn't the way out of the problem. Actually, what we're solving, what we're not addressing is the systemic issues. It's not a supply side problem of actually houses. It's actually a systemic side problem in terms of how we finance our land economy, how we allow it to be rent sold. So when we're trying to solve certain problems, how do we make sure we're strategic into that story? And one of the challenges I think I have for the architectural conversation and perception is that as architects, we became so obsessed by actually getting integrated into the vertical engineering chain that we didn't, we let go of strategy and understanding how our built environment operated with society and economy in a different way. And without that competence, I think we can sometimes be guilty of assisting a bad solution. And so how do we start to acknowledge this complexity? And this goes all the way through to stories like this, which is like uh, uh, Sir Patrick Vallance's work on obesity, right? 
on obesity, which is really interesting because what it shows is that actually obesity is a function of multiple issues. And if you want to solve obesity, say in a neighborhood or in a place or a city, actually it requires a new thesis on coordinating across that complexity, across this complexity with multiple actors. So when we want to design change in a place, it's not just about the physical environment, but it's also about the biases we construct. It's also about the shops and the planning legislation around those shops and what those shops sell. It's also about the culture of walking. It's also about hundreds of other soft things, uh, personal psychology and social psychology around this stuff, uh, safety, security, hundreds of other factors, as well as the food groups and other things. So how do we construct that systems change of a place? I think is a really critical issue. And in a way, I've mentioned this all, that many of these systems exist, but what a crisis does is declare how these systems are cascading. And you can see how COVID has kind of made visible the risk in our society in a way that, that we never discuss. And the thesis of risk, and it, this is again a language not traditionally used in architecture, except for kind of contracts. I think the, what we have to also understand is that we as the society are generating risks for many, many generations ahead of us. We are creating risks and actually making future generations' lives more vulnerable, more precarious in a way that we could not imagine. And I think we are contributing that, but actually we have no mechanism of accountability. They can't hold us accountable at this stage, but we are definitely generating huge amounts of risk uh, in order to pertain and sustain a uh, a life and a, a mechanism of living that's currently not viable. So there's a really interesting question about how intergenerationally we acknowledge these risks and actually operate. And it's very clear, you know, one of the things I often say is community good and public good aren't the same thing. A community good is a group of people, it's a bounded idea of good, whereas public good is actually transcends both in space and time, that boundary. So how do we start to operationalize ourselves and operationalize change? It's this reality. And I'm going to go big, carry on going big for one more second, and then we'll start to narrow in. And I suppose what I want to sort of really get into is that I think it's really important that we recognize that I think we've been operating in an age of, you know, and people like um, um, Kate from Donut Economics, Kate Rayworth, uh, talks about this really eloquently, where, you know, human has been perceived as an economic agent, it's a rational economic agent. And in order to preserve the rationality of that economic agent, one of the key things has been we have to make humans the short, um, what I would say is precarious. The more precarious a human is, the more quasi-rational, instrumentalizable they will be. And we often see this in government literature, which is like, you know, we can't have too high welfare, otherwise people won't do anything. That's an understanding that you can only instrumentalize people through money. You can coordinate and organize them through money. And we know that that's a, that's a thesis, that's a macroeconomic thesis. However, but we also know that if you create sustainable precariousness, sustainable precariousness as a condition, and as a context, what you create and drive is a short termism in human decision making. So if our environment, and I use my, the word environment, is both our built environment, our institutions, our labor infrastructure, our education institutions, are all about making us sustainably precarious, or many of us, not all of us. What that drives is a precariousness that derives a short termism of how we make decisions. So in recessions, we know that people in those moments make decisions about buying chocolates, getting the hair done, getting nails done, getting um, sort of buying fast fashion. We take short psychological goods to fix our precariousness. It's a patch on our precariousness feeling but it allows us to be economically instrumentalized, i.e. we will work because we have, it's a vital reality of us working. That economic theory has been a critical part of our organizing theory of, of the world. The challenge becomes, and this is why I look forward, is that we're moving to a new economic theory. And the new economic theory says that actually humans are going to have to be contributing not as instrumentalized agents, but care, craft, creativity, high co cognitive uh, um, work, these sort of attributes are not instrumentalizable. You can't pay someone to care, you can pay someone for their time. Care itself is a relationship problem. Craft itself is a care problem. 
creativity is not a is not a consumable product. Creativity is a context driven situation. If you look at these capabilities, these five C's working in complexity, they require a different sort of environment, an environment which isn't about extrinsic control, but intrinsic foundational capabilities. And, you know, if we then look at places like, and that's where, you know, I would say, look at the work that happened in Finland around uh, universal basic income, what you started to realize was it created different psychological context. So how do we construct a different psychological context where change is going to be a fundamental issue? And that requires us to reimagine the role of a built environment to being just a just built environment, a new type of institutional infrastructure, which accounts for the mental load and the mental stresses we create. A new type of freedom infrastructure, which is about creating a freedom to care because actually we to remove precariousness. A new type of civic intelligence and self-altering capability. Volk schools were developed in Sweden uh, at the mi middle of the 19th century because, you know, as many of you know, Nordics were one of the poorest economies in the world and societies in the world. And they built vault schools, which are places for people's self-authoring capabilities, building people's capabilities to author themselves. This was about human development centered. So when in the middle of a crisis, they recognized the key pathway to human development is not instrumentalization, but actually is the capability to self-author people, uh, self-author your lives. So how do you create the context and the institutional landscape to build this reality for this new type of economy will be fundamentally different. And it's an intrinsically motivated economy with a declaration of interdependence at the center of it, as opposed to intrinsically, uh, extrinsically motivated economy, uh, sorry, the, the, the intrinsically motivated economy for the new reality, um, as opposed to an extrinsically motivated economy on the basis of in, in, uh, independence. So I think we're seeing a macroeconomic transition for societies that is going to require a new sort of environment, but also new capabilities of being human. And the human development thesis, I think, is a really key part. So as we move forward, and I just want to lay that out because I think it's, you know, when we start to think of the future of cities and places, I think it's really critical that we recognize this also a new human development transition. And it's worth recognizing, maybe I'll just sort of pause for a second. It's worth recognizing that when the uh, Industrial Revolution was happening in the UK in the 1750s onwards, the UK had already done its educational reforms. And that combined with the distribution of wealth, which was unusual compared to Holland, which was controlled by five or six families, I think, actually created the context for a new industrial revolution, a new transformation of society. Denmark, after, its, um, after it went bankrupt uh, in 1813 and 14, 1814, I think, turned around and actually invested in, in educational reform as its first act, because it recognized human development as the pathway to a new society. So I think we're in a moment where we start to think about the future of our cities and places. I think it's really important we sort of re-ground this thesis in a, in a bigger, bigger trajectory. And also, I think we need to ground it into a kind of idea of horizons of known risks and actually how we operationalize ourselves into them and preparing for risks that are knowable. And then also actually an age of unknowable risks or uncertainty. And when we're operating into an age of complexity and uncertainty, what becomes critical is how do you build the anti-fragility of our cities? How do you build the anti-fragility of our, of our cities to be able to cope with shocks? So and that requires the decentralization of innovation and capability. That requires the decentralization and the distribution of capability to be able to respond to risk. That requires a new type of interdependence and that requires a new recognition of, um, of, um, of care between agents. That requires a new sort of social accord and the construction of social legitimacy in that process is really critical. So, I think it's really important as we design and think about places that we start to operationalize ourselves through the, some of these things. And you know, again, this is a bit geeky and many of you will be going, why have I not shown some nice architecture? And I suppose I'm trying to resist and I'm sure there will be other speakers that will go down that line. And I, I suppose what I'm trying to say is that as we move into this new age of interdependence, actually we're going to be uh, dealing with lots of transformations. And some of the deep code errors that we've got, for example, property rights is about how you, you know, in a way, if you look at the history of property rights and many of these things, they are theses of how we control a piece of land. So we enslave a piece of land to the needs of one person. 
what is the future of property rights? We're already seeing some really interesting work, some of it we've been involved with around micro treaties with land, where land itself becomes self-sovereign, where trees are self-sovereign and you actually have a relationship with them. So we know New Zealand has turned around and made us a, um, a whole river self-sovereign. So what are these structural issues that we need to deal with? And how do we start to make new decision-making mechanisms in society? And it's really critical that we recognize our thesis of architecture has been constructed out of a very centralized modernist command and control model, which is about architects designing things and other people executing to their demand, as opposed to recognizing the distribution of craft and agency and innovation that would create purposeful architecture. So what is our management and organization model? How do we stop instrumentalizing everything to our perceived needs? How do we build new forms of accountability mechanisms that allow for decentralized innovation? How do we build new types of incentives? How do we build many of these things all the way down the chain? And I think we have to start to think about things on a much more structural level. How do we build a shared language of looking at our places um, in, in many formats? So many, in many ways, I think one of the things that we're recognizing is that if you want to drive change, you have to not only just physically manifest change, you have to be able to look at it diagonally all the way through to policy and regulation. And that requires a different form of capability because actually it requires you to think about the physical living context, but also look at all the other contexts and how they come together to create that. It's very clear that you know, if you ask many people, um, if they like uh, cul-de-sacs and they'll say yes they love cul-de-sac but actually if you look at it from an abstract level as a physical design level I think many research was done said oh you know cul-de-sacs are terrible urban ideas and for, for many in some ways they are but they also depend on social context so I think the form how form is constructed and networked into other social contexts is really critical and I think we have to think much more diagonally as designers across this reality and think through some of these systems and be have the language to think through these systems and operate openly across these dimensions and in a way I think one of the key things I, I wanted to say is that we, we need to start to think about the failures, which is the future destruction of common resources, liabilities, all these things that are coming on, antibacterial resistance, heat island effects, soil degradation. These are all happening in our environment. Um, chronic illness, loneliness, or mental health crises. Then really look at the causes behind that, but also then look at some of the deep structural issues that lie behind that. How do we go from that issue all the way down to the deep structural code issues, like I said, property rights and other frameworks, which are constructing a way of seeing the world and operationalizing new forms of power. And how do we drive innovation when it isn't just a single magic bullet, when it actually requires 50 different organizations to do something differently, to transform a neighborhood? What is our thesis of innovation, which isn't just about us drawing a plan and telling everyone to follow it, to actually, actually creating the frameworks for large-scale coordination and large-scale enabling and empowering people to do things differently, you know, in the, in, for complex problems. And for me, these things are often governed in these, these layers, the bureaucratic, the governance, the accounting, and the financial laws. So that's kind of setting the scene. And I, I wanna, I, I wanna, I'll quickly go through this latter part, then hopefully we can get into some questions and discussion, because uh, we've got, so I wanna pick up five boring things. And one thing I'd like to say as we look into the fall future, I think one of the key challenges that I'd say is we often talk about the private economy. And, and I want to talk about the private economy versus the civic economy. And what does the difference? This is the New York High Line. Um, and many of you will know it. And, but one of the things that you will perhaps not know is that the High Line, for example, uh, is a really amazing, beautiful thing, was uh, if you uh, just took 10% of the land value attributable to the high line, land value uplift attributable to the high line, um, you would have paid for the high line in 10 months. And why I say that is that that starts to communicate that actually civic goods create, create, <coughs> sorry, civic goods <coughs> create private value. And these civic infrastructure, the same can be communicated about schools. Schools put up to £100,000 on the price of a local house. Same can be said about um, trees. A tree-lined street will put seven to £10,000 on the local house. So civic goods create this private value. And actually, unless we're able to really rethink the relationship with civic goods and private value, 
we, which I think has been historically the problem. We've assumed that the private right, the private uplift of the land owners is their own. I think we start to get problematized. So one of the things we've been looking at is how do you build an economy for civic goods? And you know, we've been looking at smart covenants, which say, you know, if your land value goes up, how do you then share some of the land value uplift with an algorithm that's going to be structured out so we can actually look at the differential uh, land increases and actually share some of that land value uplift with the high line or the civic asset. And why that's important is that starts to create a new value model for civic goods. So we can start to move the economy from being all about the private contract and the private value to this idea of the civic value. And why that's critical and possible now, which is why I'm saying this, is that digital technology and sort of uh, a new co you know, machine contracting mechanisms allow us to be able to contract with 10,000 people dynamically attribute the value and be able to finance these goods. The Highline has created so much value, the Highline Trust still struggles to be able to operationalize itself. So if we want to finance civic goods, which many architects draw or dream up, we have to be able to actually change the deep dark matter of the contractual relationship of value to be able to finance this economy. And, and I increasingly think the nature of the machine contracting infrastructure, which is the cost of bureaucracy going to near zero, the cost of bureaucracy going to near zero creates a radical new business model and value model for civic goods. So I think one of the things we'll see in the 21st century is civic goods and civic value being actually radically invested in, as opposed to the 19th century and the 20th century, where we saw the dominance of the private contract and private value. And that's a function of the reduction of cost of bureaucracy. And we will see, actually, as we you know, as we're seeing some really interesting work happening around title deeds and the unbundling of property rights, actually constructing whole new relationships with both land, but also property and use in really radical formats, opening up new formats of operationalizing, actually how we transform our living environments, how we actually sort of um, can share, uh, can have differential taxation on future development rights, how we look at the generative power of our, of our land in itself, how we look at the biodiversity relationships, doing a project in, uh, in Montreal looking at actually how do you convert lawns to meadows because the reality is lawns are really terrible ecological resources whereas meadows are massively rich ecological resources in terms of sustainable urban drainage, heat island effects and various other things. So how can you start to kind of create new types of incentives which actually advance the transition into these things or price actually the ecological diversity losses that lawns create. So we can suddenly start to do lots of interesting things using satellite data to be able to be able to automate many of these economies. And this is all about recognizing that places create spillover liabilities. Bad housing in the UK generates huge amounts of healthcare costs. So housing is not just a house, it's actually got linked reliabilities and possibilities. A great house will contribute to many, many other things as well. A poor housing will actually create huge amount of costs, socialized costs for all of us. So how do we think about the house as a private asset? Is it really a private asset or is it a private liability uh, which li creates liabilities for all of us? And this is manifest in places like you know, the million dollar blocks work that happened in Chicago and the US, which looked at neighborhoods which are costing the state millions of dollars, private neighborhoods, because of actually levels of number of people going to jails and, and penal correction environments. Um, were over a million dollars a year um, and they were looking at how could we take that million dollar a year and invest into those neighborhoods to support their renewal. And it's again looking at our reality, looking at our design, looking at the physical environment, not just from design costs, not just from capital costs, not even just from operational costs of the building, which is the FM, but actually the total cost of delivering and operating that building and the local economic multiplier. When you see the built environment from this multi-dimensional range, you design differently. You design built environment, you design a building as a knot of value, as a kind of knot of value which constructs these flows, which can actually be deeply regenerative for its environment. Second is kind of our thesis of kind of governance and control and many of the things we talk about, most of our control models, most of our thesis on governance, and I think this applies in many ways to the rule of architecture, but also many of the things are going to be disrupted. You're starting to see all of that stuff. You know, most of our economy is constructed on analog rule-based systems. Machine rule-based systems will create new possibilities, but also new forms of tyranny if we don't get it right. Machine learning, uh, machine learning systems are already trying to automate some processes. Algorithms 
platforms that are being used across governments to be able to operationalize certain things, creating new biases um, and, a co and hardwiring old biases. So how do we govern places in the new machine assisted age? And I think these are really critical questions for actually the design and operational of our place, especially if you put some something like uh, augmented reality, which will become very, very critical over the next five to 10 years in terms of how we operationalize those stories. And how do we start to rebuild the relationship between machine, human and ecological systems, which I think will be fundamental in the transition. So the role of machine economy rule systems is going to be vital. How do we go from a governance horizon age, which is not about control using technology to, to tell us what we can and we can't do. So not about the car stopping and saying you can't do more than 30 miles an hour because it's legally not allowed, but how does a car support or any environment support you to be ennobled? So how do we use governance in machine learning to create ennobling environments? We've done a piece of work with Nesta around civic AI and looking at how we could actually augment civic assets to be part of this ennobling environment that invite new forms of gifts and relationships <coughs> and accountabilities. <coughs> And I think the operationalization of these sort of ennobling environments of our places is going to be critical. And in a way, this all goes back into other pieces of, of ownership and various models of kind of uh, organizing, which I'll, I, I suppose I'm, I can get back into later. Next, I think we, we need to look at our natural infrastructure. I mean, I don't know, I hope many of you are watching that, you know, places like Madrid are looking to plant 3 million trees and uh, spend half a billion dollar, uh, euros planting a forest, of, a, forest a, a ring of forests around Madrid. How do we start to actually have, we know we're going to see a massive investment in natural infrastructure across our cities. It's probably the biggest thing we're going to see. And this natural infrastructure is going to create a new... How do we do that? Is that going to be just a herd of uh, sort of sort of large-scale forests abandoned, isolated with fences around them? Or are, they, or are they going to be fundamentally new types of relationships, micro-urban forests, which, which you've seen the work of, hopefully in Tokyo uh, around micro-urban forests, which can be actually very beautifully designed, but also support sustainable urban drainage, heat island effects, all sorts of secondary issues at the table. And then again, looking at our thesis of governance, what does governance look like in the 21st century? And again, looking at new possibilities, which is new forms of uh, regulatory frameworks, we are going to see a transformation of how we regulate our built environment in an age of complexity, when, when we can do policy as code and law and regulation. We're already seeing the beginnings of that story. What does that look like? I don't know. Uh, well, I'm, I'm, I suppose I can, I can just say it and we can just start a conversation. I suppose the fundamental point I was trying to make was that we can see this arc of transition. But what is critical to me is I think we're seeing a foundational transition in what it means to be human and, and our relationship to the world, our relationship to each other, to not being of control, but actually about actually how we build a new type of relationship to support discovery, our relationship to the future, which is not about colonization and control, our relationship with nature, which is not about dominion and control, our relationship with things, which is not on ownership and, and enslavement. I think we're, that, that thesis was a function of the last 300, 400 years of looking at the world through both separation of human from environment, which is iconicized by effectively the astronaut in space, you know, isolated, pristine, looking down on Earth. That dominion, which is the kind of rights over everything, and then the thesis of control, the mechanisms of control, property rights, employment law, these are all mechanisms of control. I think these things are being questioned as we enter a new age where we are moving from an age of, an age of independence to an age of interdependence and an age of entanglement. And that entanglement requires new ways of relating to the future. So our relationship with things, our relationship with nature, our relationship with the future and our relationship with each other is fundamentally being transitioned. And you're seeing the weak signals of this everywhere. And that will create that will create an implicate order, a new type of implicate order of the world we see around us, and a new relationship to cities and places and the environments we live in. And that's I think is really worth us recognizing, because I think the vision of the city, which is drawn, you know, with skyscrapers and flying cars, <coughs> misses this structural transition. And I suppose in this whole talk, which I'm sorry there were some technical difficulties. This whole talk is really trying to suggest that there is a transition in the deep orders 
of how we live and how we relate to the world. And only by understanding that can we perhaps start to see what a future way of living could look like and a scaffold, a few new future reality for all of us to live in. Thank you, Indy. Um, so we've got Peter Buchanan here and his, uh, one of the, his lecture series at the LSA is called Humanity and the Planet. Um, so perhaps Peter, do you have some questions for Indy? Yeah, I have lots of questions and lots of comments. Um, uh, it'd be interesting to respond to the points in your uh, question, but I'd also like to get back to actually talking a little bit about zero zero and why you set that up, and also to what degree that represents the kind of things that you're talking about. I mean, I actually thought your summing up was actually brilliant. The whole lecture was brilliant, but in a way it was like having a book thrown at you. You kind of just want to go through chapter by chapter, this, and how do you make this kind of accessible? Um, I'm thinking all the time, that maybe what you need to do is make a series of Pixar movies, which make this kind of vivid, because what we want is not a sense of the brilliant analysis, brilliant criticism that you offered, but actually what this means in living reality. And I absolutely agree with you. This is one of my thesis that we're at the point where the question is, what is it to be human and how do we redefine that? And part of it, which is actually what you were saying, I'm just changing the word slightly, is that we have to come to a sense that we actually belong on this planet and we need to participate in it. We need to join the dance of other things. Everything went wrong a long time ago, but particularly since the Enlightenment, when everything became a resource and we just, exactly. that's what became so incredibly destructive. We need to surrender control and join the dance, be part of this living system. Part of it also is the kind of whole Newtonian system of the dead clockwork universe, the rationality which you rightly decried, and the rationality we feel excluded from the world, we feel insecure, we feel precariousness, and we're in the dying age of Newtonianism, as I think, that if we understand that actually science has moved to a living universe that's constantly creative and evolving, we have a totally different relationship with the world. Yeah. Um, I couldn't agree more. And I think one of the things I'm trying to resist, and I think is, <clears throat> so, I mean, I'll give you a practical example of our work. We're literally looking at how do you plant and organize a forest, which is self-owning, which has a new economic thesis behind it, which isn't about the colonization of that forest, which isn't about the ownership of land in a very particular way. So I think the future is going to be cast in these very small relationships. And the reason why is, is that just even a forest, it's about a new form of treaty with the forest, a new type of relationship with the forest. It's a new type of interaction, which is recognized that the forest as a living system um, and a new type of consciousness that it requires from us as citizens to recognize our interdependence with it. So it's a, really a, a, a real um, structural re-gearing into those relationships. And in a way, I'm trying to resist building these visions. And I'm sorry, you know, like like Big's future of, of architecture. I'm really avoiding colonizing the future with an image of it. Because I think as soon as anyone does that, you territorialize that future. Whereas actually, if we can construct these micro, re rebuild these relationships that Peter, you most eloquently put down, is actually going to be done in the small, in the particular and actually rebuilding the coding and practices of that. We're manifesting that even in our practice, we challenge and you know, the way we organize ourselves, where we actually we're trying to democratize the, kind of, kind of the, the organization of the practice of development of it. We're all on, um, you know, all on Slack, where, where we've actually, uh, all our governance is operating. Because I think in order to manifest these realities, you have to organize yourselves in fundamentally different ways. And, and that's been one of the big things that that you can't manifest from a command and control theory into this worldview. Command and control genuinely ends up with a kind of visual product, whereas a relational product requires a completely different type of organism behind it. I, I yeah, I mean, so I think this has been a long journey for us, and you know, you've known us for many years, Peter. I think you know whether it's Open Desk or whether it's any of these things, we were figuring out how to do this, and and I think many of this stuff is about actually how we rebuild those relationships at the level of we're doing a piece of work called the free house where we don't want the house owned uh, we want the house to be self-owning and effectively 
financed with a perpetual bond model, which means that actually over time, it degrades to being near zero cost. So actually what we're trying to build is these, and there, you, there you're not a renter or an owner, but you're a steward. And the house is a generative asset, a generative thing, generative organism that has a different relationship, which you don't own, which you don't capitalize, which you don't put on your balance sheet. So we're trying to construct these alternative organisms in the world as prototypical theses uh, in a multidimensional way. And uh, yeah, and the other thing I think would be say is, you know, we often used to talk about, and you'll probably remember this, and certainly Bath was heralded, you know, you need the environmental engineer, you need the structural engineer, and the integration happens there. And more and more, I think one of the big things we've been doing is, you know, we've got coders in the, in, in, we have coders, finance people, we've got researchers, we've got uh, data scientists working together. So I think there's also a new type of hybridity of relationships coming together to be able to design some of these things and make these things. And I think that's a really interesting type of integration that I think we've often missed out in the architectural domain, um, which we've kind of vertically integrated into the material economy, not, not, not into the other parts of the economy. So, yeah, I mean, it, unfortunately, it's really not unfortunately, you know, it's small things because I think we can't, there's so many things to do. You know, everything we touch, an employment contract is problematic. An employment contract is all about control. It isn't actually about ennoblement. So you could touch anything and you see it manifest the problems of this relationship structure. Um, and it manifests through all of our environments. Sorry, Peter. No, I, I agree, absolutely. But I think that there's not a conflict between doing things small, because I think that's the most effective way, and the big picture. What we need is a vision where we want to get to. And the question yeah. is, what's the next small step towards it? Because big steps manifest huge inertias, huge resistances, and so on. Actually, the things that create change are small things that kind of escalate over time. And the, to try and marry those two visions is, is the, the trick, I think, of creating change. And uh, exactly. I, I agree absolutely that it's the small change. What's the next small change that will actually snowball, will escalate, get out of control? Um, but you know, I, I suppose one thing I would say is that, I mean, I, I think for me, reimagining our relationship with nature there's going to be so much capital poured into nature-based solutions and either they're instrumentalized quasi machines for a financial economy or they're actually the basis of a new relationship to us and the world around us and i think there's a really interesting moment in those environments to do that i also think that the way i talked about there, there will be a huge amount of money in the next few years poured into retrofit. Is that retrofit of our neighborhoods and places? How that's done? Who owns that? Is that a new rent seeking architecture for private capital or capital? How do we build new civic value around that? How do we construct that with a new um, uh, thesis around it? It's really critical. So I, I agree with you. I think there's, there are real clear pathways ahead. I suppose one of the reasons I give this gave this lecture in this format, and Peter, you'll appreciate it, but just probably for this conversation, was that I think it's really important for us as architects to draw this line of information, to draw these, to, to bring out this discussion. One of the things I massively appreciated over the years about all your work is you've drawn these deep narratives that link these issues together to allow architects to be cognizant and clear and communicative about how, the, how place links these things together to manifest reality in a different format. And I think it's really important for us as architects to actually be bold enough to, to think big and act, as you say, appropriately and, and intimately and relationally if possible. Um, no, absolutely. And I'm kind of curious because yours is a, it's an evolving ecology, your, your practice. Um, zero, zero is, it starts with a kind of architectural practice, but it's become many, many different things. And me as an outsider, I'm kind of curious what uh, inspires you to make the next expansion into the next field. And in some ways, I get the feeling that it's partly personal relationships that you kind of, so you find somebody interesting and say, yeah, you've got to be part of my network. That, I'm, I might be completely wrong. That's just a kind of intuitive response. And I'm curious about the ethos and so on that you've set up, that you've set up this kind of network of 
you could say loving relationships with between people but it's, it's kind of like a fungal system rather than an, uh, an, an ordinary um, office it's not a mechanistic pr process at all it's much more a natural uh, process and it, i think because the lsa differs from other schools it lays a big uh, emphasis on the relationship with practice for instance, I think one of the smartest things is that students in the first year here, which is constitutes their fourth year of education, write a manifesto for the kind of practice they want to have in their future. I think to be setting that while you're a student is a really important idea. And a talk like yours is very important in terms of inspiring these new visions of what practice could be. And so I'd just like to hear you talk about your own practice and your own relationships within it. Yeah, I, I mean, I suppose it comes from a very two very basic things. Um, <clears throat> when David and I, we met at Bath, there were two basic things. We were very interested in how do we, how do we support and empower democracy? And, the, and democracy, I don't mean the vote, I mean the democratic capacity of people to make society. And for us, that would seem to be the kind of big inherent issue. And so you would say Open Desk, WikiHouse were all manifestations of that. The second part was that was just we wanted to address the um, what I would say the inherent contradiction in architecture, which is on one hand, I was in an architectural practice which at the you know when we were seventeen people we were designing uh, handrails which were had nodules in them because tactile memory is one of the last memories to go. We grew to being a seventy person practice. Right? and we were designing colorful buildings. And the reason wasn't because the people had changed or become morally less, less moral or anything. It was a function of command and control. What could somebody in a 70 person practice control? And all you could really control was the visual image. Mm. Everything else became actually a function of it. So if you design a practice for command and control, you create an abstraction of architecture from particular to the abstract and we construct buildings through abstractions. And it became clear to us that in a highly relational engaged entangled world, we needed a completely different thesis of practice, which wasn't about command and control, but actually a learning system and a learning model at the center of it. So for us, I and mean, this is a, you know, we, we, we do many things wrong, you know, that's, and we're not perfect by any stretch. And for us, it's been, how do you build if you recognize real innovation has to always sit at the edge by the person doing the work, then everything else is actually a servant system to support that innovation. And historically, the model has been completely the other way, which is a command and control model. And so I think if we're gonna build that, so that was one thing. The other thing, the third dimension of this conversation has been we've always just followed. So, you know, we built, uh, so when we were doing Architecture Zero Zero, we wrote about the Civic Compendium, we built this, um, the bit, Bristol Urban Beach, which we physically did. Then we used that, and then we learned a lot from that. Then we got involved in building impact hubs, so we physically not just designed them, <coughs> but operationalized them and, and even owned them. We helped set up two social investment structures. We built OpenDesk, and we set up an open source furniture company. We set up WikiHouse, open source housing. So we built things, learned things. And as we learned them, we learned, there were spirals of learning and operationalization. When we were doing WikiHouse and OpenDesk, it became very clear that you know how we contracted was really problematic because it was creating a form of centralization. So as we did something, we learned the next step, and I think this is the craft of of of, of making in a way that you follow. You just follow the adrenal thread. So I don't think it's strategy in a kind of oh my god, we knew this all, we were all going to do it. Actually, it's really really just oh oh oh, this is the problem. This is what we need to solve next and it's just and next that combined with an idea of kind of actually creativity craft requires a new type of relationship uh, in practice a new type of being in practice because that's the only way we're going to innovate in an entangled world and democratizing that those are probably the three corners to and, and i think it comes from enlightened self-interest it doesn't even come from some form of oh my god we want to be good i think this is the only way to operate if we're going to create uh, create a world that we all want to live in. Yeah, no, if you define the self as part of the world, then self-interest is what's best for the world. And as the cliche goes, the best way to learn quickly is to fail more. 
which is, you know. Well, we've done that. <laughs> well, we've done our fair share of that. But, but uh, one other comment is that you don't use the word, but a lot of the time you talk about the implications are about a huge cultural shift. And the big lacuna in modernity, I think, is the dismissal of culture as a thing, because yeah. that was the mumbo jumbos. I mean, science built culture. And I think we actually have to be much more open about that. Architecture is not going to return to being vivid and life supporting until we see it as an activity, a cultural activity. We're not making gadgets which people use. We're making something which are mediators between us and this larger world, which is what a cultural artifact, what buildings were before modernity. They actually, why do we treasure pre-modern buildings? It's because they have value for more than our, their use. They are things which tell us how to live, that they have all kinds of, they tell us about the larger world, they tell us about the ancient world, they tell us all, and that's the dimension that has destroyed modern architecture and modernity and the planet. Um, but you I, didn't mention culture. I, I noticed- No, I, you, no, you, I think you're, you're, you're spot on right, Peter. And I think um, you're right to call, call me up on it. And I think you're absolutely right in your identification as well. Um, I, I think, I, I, I think, I would say we're on an arc, and we haven't quite got to exactly where you're saying we need to get to, but I know it. That is exactly right. But I, I think we're just in that moment of kind of, you know, when you, when you're learning to draw, you're having to be hyper conscious of everything, and everything is very conscious. I think we're at that moment where we're hyper conscious, but we haven't yet become. It hasn't become cultural. We're not. We're not artists yet, and we're we're far too rational to be that. we but we're we. I understand the value of exactly what you're saying, because that means that we have to understand everything through a relationship in a fundamentally different way. So I, yeah, I totally hear you, and I think culture. I think the big landscape, and you you you'll know this better than I will. You know, Vitruvian Man, all the Leonardo da Vinci work, all of that stuff that was going on. It was a cultural philosophical revolution um that was at the center of it and i think i think we have to recognize and it's language as well uh, it's one of the things that if we could work with language artists we really would because language is one of our tools because one of the things that you'll know this better, again better than i will but you know the english language is 80 percent contemporary english language use is 80 percent nouns it's object orientated mm. whereas actually we need a relational language so we need to, we need to be more verb based in our language structures to be able to operationalize into an entangled world. So there's something structural going on, and it's in our ways of seeing, in our ways of language. So I think you're right. There's a kind of, you know, there's a cultural revolution waiting to be catalyzed. There's a there's a massive thing there, which I think we haven't yet begun. I don't think we're there. Uh, but certainly we, as a practice, I think if I was to be self critical to, of us. We're probably hyper structuralists in a way. We're, we're, we're componentry people. We're thinking it through the components. I think there'll be a next generation of practitioners who will be the real artists with, with kind of building blocks. I think we're too crude because we're thinking through things. That's just by my honest, honest opinion. Yeah, no, it makes a lot of sense to, to me. I mean, even as a designer, it, you're not actually using your conscious mind all the time. You kind of make conscious decisions. Then you just let your fingers do things. And then your conscious mind comes in and says, well, is that better or is it not? And very often it is when you're not thinking. It's actually when you make the huge improvements to a design. Okay. It occurs to me, though, that I'm kind of hogging the time. And it would be interesting to get questions from the floor, if, if that's possible. Sure. We, have, we have a few. Um, we have one from Miriam who asked this within a, an architectural lens. So an architectural lens. She says, how does one think about or think of changing the world in today's context without seeking to control it, comma, recognizing the multifaceted power dynamics which are not yet open to change. Well, I, I think, like I say, I, I, change is happening around us. I don't buy, I, I think you can monolithically say there's no change, but actually I think we're seeing massive amounts of you know, like if you look at the work that's happening in Canada with indigenous nations, which are challenging all these theses of property and even sovereignty of nations, plurinationality, forests being self-sovereign, um, rivers being, you know, we're seeing stuff happening already. 
Um, I think we're on the cusp of many of these things in terms of actually our relationship with the conversation even about the circular economy, albeit the word is economy at the center of it. I think that's gonna challenge our thesis of ownership. The question is, is that you, thesis of ownership by, by citizens replaced by a thesis of ownership by corporations, which is problematic. And I think what we have to do is replace that, that we have to challenge that thesis of stewardship all the way down to the chain of a public trust, which actually owns and controls those resources. So I think we're seeing those transformations. I think technology is also driving many of these discourses as well. Um, so I suppose I see, I sit on the other hopeful side of the story that I think that these things are already in play. I think the one thing I would say is, and this is just my own regret and, you know, maybe a conversation for us, is I don't see, you know, it's such an honor to actually, whenever I get time with Peter, I'm always like, God, we need to talk more, is that it's so rare to have this conversation in architecture. That I find problematic, is that I think the world is doing this, but not necessarily architecture is doing this, mm -hmm. right? So, and I don't think architecture in the built environment is really having deep conversations about the structure of the transition and just to talk about london for a second i'm deeply disturbed that you know i think london is at the cusp of failure not because i think london is poor but i think the scale of transition london faces is actually not being addressed and i think we have to recognize london is going through a deep transition so i'm hopeful i think we have a role to play we have a role to play as as contributors to this, this discourse I think the ed there are edits already going on around the world, and I can name you know thousands of them uh, in, in in many ways. But I think what we need to do is find ways to to support them and be literate about them. I suppose together as a as a group. That that would be my response. So Peter, now I was going to say before we let somebody else ask another question, we are at the, in the process of deep change. But I think that we're also seeing what Marshall McLuhan called sunset effects before something ends, it reaches its most extreme. You know, the sun goes yeah. down, we get the fireworks. And I think what we're seeing in architecture, in medicine, and all kinds of things, the sunset effects. These, it marks, like, well, this is a, a positive spin on a lot of horrible stuff, that it's got so extreme and so stupid, surely this must be close to the end, it's going to collapse. <laughs> um, I, I, no, I agree. I, I, my wish would be, I, I agree with that. I, I think, and again, talking amongst friends, I really am struggling um, with the intellectual domain of the profession. Yeah. And yeah. I think it's the weakest it's ever been, effectively. Yeah. Um, uh, and not only is it weak, I think we were weak standing on weak foundations. So we are weak, but actually our foundations that were given to us were not that strong either. And so there's a real need to grow our, our appetite to be able to talk, philosophize, think, and do in an integrated way. And I think we've become far too instrumentalized and far too down instrumentalized as agents of kind of what I'd call visualization, as opposed to actually agents of deep structured change. And one hope I'd say is that it, my 15 years or whatever, has proven to me it is not a client problem. No. Like, I, I think I often hear, where do you get the clients? And it's not the client or a part of the problem. It's our problem. No. Clients want this. Clients want somebody who can actually think about their problems short, medium, long term, talk about risk, talk about a new form of public accountability, talk about this. I was talking to sister. Um, uh, uh, so Stuart Lipton, we were talking about many of these issues, and he was like, this is the issue. We need architects to take public liability about the decisions. We need architects to become more cognizant about that. And I, so I don't think this is either a client problem, but I think we have to, as a profession, become, I'd love to hear, Peter, your views on this, but I just think, you know, my, my slightly churlish response is, you know, we were sitting on um, a theory of uh, abstract paintings are sort of a, architectural theory is largely abstract paintings. <laughs> it's not even theory. Um, and now we're sitting on the shoulders of abstract, theory, uh, abstract paintings as opposed to any form of actual knowledge, which I think has been really vacated. But Peter, what, what's your reflection? Uh, this is a big conversation. I absolutely sure. agree with you. And I think that um, after a kind of loss of faith in modern architecture in the 70s when you know people were talking about flattening the garden and building tower blocks i mean it became so stupid 
we actually perhaps made an even worse turn into French philosophy, French theory, and all just form making. And there's been a collapse of architectural culture and how we rebuild architecture, how, how we talk about what's relevant in architecture, what's quality in architecture, all these things, they have to be done. And it's unfortunately not something that has been done in academia. I mean, it's a kind of question that a few people raise here in the LSA, but it's, it's being ignored elsewhere, the, the issues that should be being discussed. Um, still, I think it would be interesting to hear somebody else uh, come in, but uh, this is a question, this is a conversation we could go on for hours at another time. Uh, I'm, I'm very relaxed as well, so I have no particular time threshold, so I'm very relaxed if people can ask questions and have a discussion. Uh, we do have another question. Uh, this one from Antonio, who addresses quite a, a topical conversation at the moment about object-oriented ontology. He says, in the framework of object-oriented ontology and empathy as a subconscious appreciation of cosmological complexity, do you feel that the Western secular tradition of alienating spirituality is something architectural design should work on? Yes, absolutely. What a great question. Um, I, I suppose I'm going to answer it in slightly simpler ways. Um, firstly, I think it's really important we don't problematize history. Yeah. I think this is an error in, in both respect and also an error in how we operate. I think history got us to where we are. I think we should problematize always the future because <laughs> that is what we have control over. And the reason why I say that is not because we have not made mistakes in history, inevitably, thousands, millions, billions of them. But I think I also recognize that perhaps there was a pathway of the object oriented worldview was constructed in a, in a thesis of terra nullis, i.e. a thesis of the world being infinite and vacated. It was a way of seeing the world and it allowed and it facilitated a mechanism and economic theory, which was, which was basically allowing for colonization. But let's also remember many of the civilizations were doing very similar things. It's not a, it, it, it's a, it's a theory of power. Um, and, and I think when you start to talk about that, what we've reached is the end of a cycle. And the cycle of object oriented thinking, which actually ignores the interdependence, was vital and viable for a period. Now those micro externalities are now feedbacking into us to creating a new form of actually the, the feedback is self terminating us. So I think, you know, we've gone from an infinite planet, perceptibly infinite, to a small world of interdependence. At the same time, that requires foundationally, at the same time, our perception of being human has transformed. Quantum physics, I mean, David Bohm's work, so many brilliant philosophers um, were looking at this thesis of implicate order and kind of entanglement and all these relationships. We also have a different thesis of the future, both in terms of how we are. So I think, I think that's why I link the thesis of human development to a different pathway to the future. Because I think without linking the human development infrastructure, I don't think we can make the great societal leap forward in that pathway. Now, I think this is a bridge to the fog, as in I don't know what that future looks like. All I can probably pathway is that scaffolding that human development infrastructure is going to be foundational to that future. And that requires us to recode all the relationship structures that we've had and built over the last 300 years, first Newtonian enlightenment, which have been very powerful in that phrase. And it's worth remembering, so Isaac Newton, whilst creating this thesis of the object oriented thermodynamic laws and everything else, was himself a polymath for multiple days. <laughs> he, he was a generation of polymaths. So it was polymaths that created a perspective, I, a, sec, a sectoral view. I think we're in a new age of polymaths. And I think what we're missing is an age of polymathic thinking, which is why I think objects are very, very potent in this moment in time, because they're trained for polymathic capacities. So, so and I think that's where to link back to the object oriented VT to interdependence. I think empathy is a key device, but I think it's human development. Uh, which I, I think freedom to escape is a kind of object oriented thesis. Freedom to care is an interdependence oriented thesis. It's about reimagining who we think we are when you recognize you're not one personality, but a confluence of personalities. It's a reconceptualization of ourselves, which then mirrors into a new relationship with the world itself. And this is why if you look back at history, I would say architects have always reconfigured the, the human and then the notion of the object and the city itself. 
and that interrelationship is now being recast in a similar manner. So um, I suppose I, that's the point I would like to make is that I'm reluctant to problematize history, but I'm, I'm conscious to say we're next and we're now at the precipice of a new evolutionary possible step. And I think that step also means that competition as a thesis is a competition between objects. Whereas actually interdependence is not driven through competition, but actually a new type of organizing capacity. So we're at a kind of, I would say, a great filter of human civilization, whereas we move from competition, object orientation, and age of independence to an age of interdependence, which I think is a new organizing feature, a new human development context, and a new way of, of society developing and growing. And I think empathy and many of the other capabilities that are identified are really critical into that, um, are very useful and very uh, cognizant. It. But I think it goes beyond external relationships, but actually starts with your own relationship with yourself. Great question. Sorry, just made, made me have to think live. Peter. Actually, a brilliant answer. As I think it was one of the best formulated things I've heard from you. And I've heard many very well formulated things. I thought it was really, really good. I hope somebody publishes it what you just said. And um, it relates to something that I have uh, gone on about, that we've been through different phases of the city, as well as moving into a different cultural phase. The traditional city was a city of being, where you were the same person wherever you were, and it was about the quality. With the modern city, is a city of doing. It's where you do things, and where you do things in different places. So it fragments who you are. You lose totally. And so we're now in the age of becoming, where not only do we shift but we actually have to redefine humanity through the things that we do. And it's the great cultural uh, thing. And this is what work is about. It's not just something that you do, it's how you create yourself, it's how you create the new world. This is the world that we, we have to move into if we're not going to get wiped out. But um, perhaps another... Right. No, I think it's really important. I, I think the word becoming is really critical because again, it breaks the object orientation. And it also puts a new form of relationship to the, both the individual and the relationship with the and the de-othering society, you know, which I think a key component. I also think one thing I think, and I haven't been able to figure this out, and um, I'd love to sort of hear, if I was to have ever, if I, I, I'd love to do a drawing of a city as a knot of flows. Yeah. And too often city definitions are defined through bounded models. So our, our thinking model is all about boundaries because actually our classical theory of organizing city, you know, Romulus turns around and takes his, you know, draws a big circle and that becomes the center of Rome and we have kind of this, this way of thinking. But actually, many cities are actually knots of flows. London is not London as a geographic boundary. London is a network of flows. Mm -hmm. And it's a knot, it's a very particular knot. And that knot creates value in a way, um, that combination. And I think our language is now holding us back. The rural urban discourse, this divide of kind of what I'd call physical geography, as opposed to recognizing this kind of flow infrastructure. And I, I think we need new taxonomy to be able to describe and operate in. And I think there's a failure of taxonomy and language right now, because I think it no longer matches the challenges that we face and thereby leads to false conclusions. And I, so there's a piece of work about re-describing this the places we live. Um, I mean, uh, the home is a place of consumption, it's a place of work, it's a place of living, it's kind of been transformed. Um, so I, I just think there's a whole, whole, uh, yeah, I think Samantha's added something to the chat as well around this, but I think there's a taxonomy, taxonological problem that I think we need to reuse and be more precise about and challenge literature around um, in that. So that's one thing I was going to add to that. Uh, just to step in again, um, I agree with you about the home. In, in a way, the medieval home is where there were multi, you know, you lived and you worked there and there were apprentices and so on. And many, I think in many ways, the, the medieval city has an incredible amount to teach us now. But I also, uh, just one thing, I agree absolutely the city is a place of flows, a lot of flows, but actually the way it's configured is crucial. It's, and the configuration of those flows and how that creates different kinds of qualities of experience and different kinds yeah. of places is absolutely crucial. And I don't see that in most of the uh, urban work that I see, um, that kind of thing. This is work that was being, that's how people were taught to think about urban work actually in the 50s already. And we have, yeah. it, it, we've lost that. 
Um, but it, I, I think I think it's also because we've lost the tools of doing it. So we don't have access to the data or flows. And so what we've become is more and more object orientated because we can draw, build walls and draw, draw things through their material shadows as opposed to the nature of the flows. And, you know, embodied carbon conversations, for example, if you want to be material on an embodied carbon conversation, we're going to have to think about the city as a network of flows of embodied carbon relationships and how those kind of embodied carbon relationships are organized. So I think we're, we're missing, you're absolutely right to say, not just language, but the mechanisms of illustrating and then the mechanism of knowing into that world. I think there's a kind of structural question there. Yeah, that's a very fair point. Um, yeah. I, mean, I just want to uh, make a point that Samantha Harding was posed to be a panelist and she says, uh, Cedric Price's definition of the city, or well, as of the city of the concentrate, addresses this idea. Um, but yeah. we've had a, um, a couple of questions come in, uh, particularly because our audience is full of young architects, maybe architects that are yet to graduate. And you, you talk a lot about deep change, but what advice would you have potentially to a young architect trying to implement the deep change that you talk about? Um, my, yeah, my biggest advice would be you can start anywhere. So you can start at the theory of a park bench. Um, and if you could think enough about a park bench in terms of who owns it, who narrates it, where the materials come from, where the materials exist into, and how they're how who owns them, who will own the liability of them. I think the world is so deeply entangled, the quality of thought, you can effectively create the shadows of a park bench to transform the world. That's the first thing I would say. Is it, it, the, and the second thing I would say is that we really must become literate, more literate about um, about the the wider forces which construct the environment that we see around us. Uh, you know, from my side, it would be contract, finance, governance, relationships, of flows, liabilities. I think it'd be really good to examine those things because I think they construct the material economy, and they construct the biases and the power structures in the material economy that we see around us. So I, 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 my big thing would be broaden, you know, broaden your horizons of engagement into the knowledge spheres that we're operating into. Um, and the second thing would be actually you can start anywhere because everywhere links to these complexities. And I think that's the richness of this current moment that I, I don't think you don't need to be get you don't need to have the rights to do a city master plan to understand these complexities and to get leadership into these complexities. You can literally start anywhere. Um, the other part I would say is that I would really, um, I would say we're an interstitial, we're a practice between worlds. Um, I think there's a whole new generation of practices that will be born into a new world. Um, and I suppose practices like ours, you know, it's, it's not, we're not natives to that new world, but what we can perhaps do is construct bridges to that. And I think it's really important for architects, for the next generation of architects and thinkers, to start to become natively literate into that new world and, and, and expose yourselves to some of the kind of conversations that are going on. Um, I mean, there's, yeah, it, there's great stuff. I mean, Peter, maybe you, you can add some stuff on it, but that would be my, my core reflection. Right. Another question. I could add lots, but there's still. <laughs> yeah. um, we have a question from Marcus. Uh, a question of machine education um, would be how a more uh, uniform, trained human brain might lead. Up, hang on. One question of machine education would be how a more uniform, trained human brain might lead in forms of society and one tribe forming. Just yeah. I'm, I'm, <laughs> yeah. I am. Um, I, I'm less um, I'm less intrigued by how machines can inform the human brain, and more intrigued by actually how machines can liberate us into creating new possibilities. I mean, I would say, you know, um, many, I hope many of you will know, the human brain is by far there is nothing close to the human brain in terms of general artificial intelligence, nothing close to it. We're maybe many, many years, if not lots of lifetimes away. Um, so I think one thing is that's not underestimate the human brain. 
Um, the second thing is I would preface this conversation in a slightly different way, which is that I think we're humans are going to be liberated from procedural process orientated um, production orientated work. And that's a new economy. And that liberation means that humans can endeavor to operate in a different economy and society. So I think there's a new symbiosis between machines and automated machines to human relate uh, to human contribution economies. And I think that's probably where I'm more interested. Um, and I see that as being a mechanism if done well is not an enslavement of humans to so i think there is a okay let's start with there is a risk that, that our machine system becomes a mechanism of control of human population systems mm -hmm. and it becomes a mechanism of control for the elite to be able to control through machine system biases and it won't be direct control it'll be bias control that's, that's what people i think too often we talk about direct control which is too it's not the way you, what the, what you control is population level biases that's what you would do. I think that is a that is a systemic risk to democracies at a structural level. I think there's another relationship, which is a different type of relationship to machines, which is actually a mechanism of liberation to, to human endeavor, human capability. And that's a new type of a next generation enlightenment, a next generation of freedom of human endeavor. And I think these are these are structural choices that we as society are going to make over the next 10, 15, 20 years. Um, in terms of how we do it and what gives me hope is that places like the scandics and the scandic nordic economies and societies have historically made transitions into an industrial age which is far more equitable than any other society so we have historic precedences of making these equitable just transitions and i think we need to learn and be able to exploit that so i'm not really uh, maybe i misunderstood the question marcus so do forgive me in that sense and please feel free to email me um, i'm happy to have a more in-depth conversation. I probably didn't understand the gist of the question, but to interpret the question in this way for conversation um, would be through this lens. Um, well, you seem to be uh, fascinated in the subjects you've raised within this talk, and they're asking uh, perhaps for just a few authors or a uh, reading list you could, which you could reel off for to, to further their knowledge and understanding of it. Yeah, yeah. No, um, um, easiest way, probably. Um, what, what am I... Uh, do you mind if I just, I'm going to literally open up my, my iBooks and I'm going to share some more this. I'm going to literally do it that way. I'm going to do it as, as honestly and coherently as I can. And so you'll just see what. Merlin Chendrick. Um, Law and the Leviathan, which is looking at uh, sort of the thesis of bureaucracy. Debt, uh, David Graeber, uh, unfortunately he passed away, an incredible, incredible man, uh, uh, talks about 5,000 years of the history of money. Um, uh, history, so 5,000 years of history, uh, debt. Uh, then I would go into uh, uh, New Dark Age by James Bridal. I'd then go into The Code of Capital by uh, Katrina Peister, uh, P-I-S-T-O-R. Which I think is a brilliant book, The Code of Capital, because she really picks out the how we legally construct capital flows, and that capital is not just money to actually concentrate wealth. She does very erudite examples how in Philadelphia, uh, slave ownership structures were replicated into the private limited company, and does very erudite conversations around that, um, all the way through to let's see uh, how the world thinks, uh, which is another. Um, sort of a uh, global history of philosophy and keep going um entrepreneurial state by marina matsukatu um uh, the skin of the game by nasim talab radical markets again uh, by eric and Pi uh, eric uh, posner which is again i think very interesting tyranny of metrics by jerry uh, z muller which i think is really worth recognizing because one of the things about metrics is metrics is a mechanism of command and control and it's about actually when you get far enough away from a problem, you use metrics to basically create systems of control. And what the tyranny of metrics is in terms of actually what that drives in gamification terms is really interesting. And I think he challenges the thesis of metrics, not as a control mechanism, but as a learning mechanism, and really builds that forward in a very, very lovely way. Prisons of Geography, Tim Marshall. Um, Homer Deus, again, by... Uh, uh, um, uh, sort of uh, Yuval Noah Harari, 
this is a book I do recommend because I think this is an author we should be thinking about. Um, the author, unfortunately, is, is Peter Thiel, but his book is Zeros to One. And I think it's really worth rec reading because I think he has a very particular view on the world, which I think, um, so he talks about a great stagnation since the 90s, not in this particular book, but as an author, he talks about <coughs> the great stagnation. And the great stagnation being since the 1970s, we've seen actually uh, scientific um, developments slow down in the West. And he talks about that being a 50 year crisis. And I think there's, it's a very erudite understanding. He also talks about the demise of polymathic thinking. Um, so I think, although being problematic for many, many reasons, and I can go into the problem side, I think it's really critical for whether it's progressive thinkers to progressive breeders and thinkers to actually engage with what I would say is an alternative, uh, the alternative discourse that is being built. Because I think there's some elements of truth which are clouded in other theses, which need to be integrated into some aspects of our, our thinking. So that's a list of books uh, that just uh, highlight something just literally in my books. Um, uh, and I'd recommend audiobooks, by the way, if you guys are like, you don't have to reading. I mean, I know how tiring uh, screens are. Um, so I tend to have lots of audiobooks when I listen to them. Awesome. Well, I think uh, that kind of brings us slightly to a natural close. And let's be any of the final a, remarks. I have a final point to make because I think it's a brilliant talk. Thank you very, very much for that. But uh, you talked about freedom. And I agree, freedom is a really key issue. But I think we misunderstand it. Modernity's great promise was freedom, freedom to do what you like. That's part of the problem, actually. And I think the spiritual traditions have a different notion of freedom, which we can learn from. Freedom is to know what is the right thing to do, and we don't know what's the right thing to do. We think choice, freedom is a huge amount of choice. It's not. It's actually knowing that this is knowing spontaneously and then being able to do that without the constraint. We live in a highly constrained society, which works in ways that people don't recognize. You go into a supermarket, you think you have all the food in the world. You don't. You have just a few uh, basic um, food sources kind of created, packaged in many different ways. So exactly. I think that one of the big issues in becoming human again is to rethink the whole notion of freedom. Freedom to exactly. be able to live in harmony with ourselves and the world. That's true freedom. I couldn't agree more. One of the things I think we have to do, and this is why... I picked on the word freedom. Uh, so we typically use the language, not freedom to escape, but freedom to care mm -hmm. uh, as a sort of discourse. Uh, but I think it's really important to reappropriate that language. So I think freedom as language has been appropriated by a very particular ideological discourse mm -hmm. and then vacated by the other side. Um, and I think freedom is a visceral quality as pieces, there's a visceral languages that have deep resonance. And, and we need to shift its in, in, intonation, as you're rightly doing, Peter, into a different frame. And I think true freedom is not a freedom to escape because that's a poverty of relationships, but a true freedom is a freedom to care. And that is only built if you can create genuine, enlightened interrelationship, a recognition of true interdependence, a recognition of not being, in contr not being controlled. It's a new type of freedom. It's a higher order freedom. And that's... A, a, and one of the things I'm deeply grateful for this conversation, and thank you so much for everyone that's put this together, is I think this is the conversations we need to be having as architects. And then what we need to be thinking about is what does this mean for our architecture and our places? And what is really a freedom to care type of place? And what is the environments and neighborhoods that we create that really build this reality? Because I think only by linking both the philosophical and the doing can we construct those pathways. And they may not be grand experiments yet. That's why I say, you know, whether it's a park bench or whether it's a tree, whether it's, you know, the small hut, I don't care. I think the truth is going to be crafted in these new reconfigurations and our relationships with the world. Uh, so I'm deeply honored both to yourself, uh, Peter and uh, Jason. And it's such an honor to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me and uh, really a privilege. An honor for us and for all, the whole audience. Thank you very, very much. No, real pleasure. Thank you, Indy. And uh, thank you, of course, to Peter and everyone else. Um, we're probably going to end things there. So um, do, stay, do stay tuned for the lectures coming up uh, for the rest of the month. We've got Leslie Loco, Anna Haringa, and Marin Tabasov. Um, they're all on Thursday at 6 p.m. And uh, details on the LSA website.